All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk here. And I'm excited to be at this beautiful place with all of you and looking forward to discussing a lot of math this week. Yeah, so um, I'm going to be talking about the average size of three torsion in class groups of two extensions. Um, and this is joint work with Robert Limke Oliver and Jia Wang. OK, so um, what do we expect and know? So if, say, L is a fixed prime, people have long asked how big can the L torsion in the class group of a number field K be. Um, and in particular, we in this talk, I'm going to be interested in how big is it on average, where you average over K um, in some family. Um, but even for a particular K, uh, there's a conjecture going back at least to Rumer and Silverman and 96, and has also come up from um, in many other works uh, that compared to the discriminant of the number field, the size of the L torsion uh, should not be able to be so big. So if we say fix um, the degree of the number field and L, that the size of the L torsion should be at most a small power of um, the size of the discriminant, in fact, smaller than any small power. So for every epsilon, um, the size of the L torsion should conjecturally um, be smaller than the epsilon power of the discriminant for any epsilon. Um, and let me just compare this to give you some sense of the distance between the conjecture uh, and what we know. So um, the Brouwer Siegel theorem, in particular, implies that the size of the entire class group um, of the number field is at most the size of the discriminant to the 1 half plus, uh, plus epsilon. So this is what we know one, that the entire class group um, can be as big as the 1 half power of the discriminant. And of course, you know, for example, um, in the um, this is a upper bound because it involves the regulator and in the imaginary quadratic um, case where there is no regulator, we know that this just sort of size of the discriminant to the 1 half actually um, do, does control the size of the entire class group. So this is about the um, entire class group, whereas this was just about the size of the L torsion for a fixed L. And so, of course, um, the size of the L torsion is at most the size of the entire class group. And the resulting bound that one gets here is what's usually called the trivial bound for the size of the L torsion, because of this part being trivial. This isn't so trivial, but this, this is. Um, all right. 
And so um, in many situations, uh, in many situations, this trivial bound of the 1 half plus epsilon is the best bound we have towards, towards this, um, this conjecture. Um, and now let me um, give some setup to talk more about, OK, what, in what situations, especially if I'm going to be talking about the average size, in what families of number fields, k, do I want to be averaging over? OK, so I'll make a definition. So the Galois group, or maybe the Galois closure group of a number field K is the permutation group which is an actual Galois group of the Galois closure of K over Q. So this K tilde is the Galois closure of the number field K over Q. And so that is some Galois group. And I said it's a permutation group, so it, I want to acting on something. So acting on the embeddings of K into the Galois closure. So we know that there are degree K of Q maps like this, and then once you're over here, the Galois group acts on them. So that's a permutation group on a finite set. Um, and it lets us put these, the number fields into natural families, whether they're Galois or not. So for example, if K is a non-Galois cubic field, then um, the Galois closure group is S3, and it acts um, on a set of three elements, act, and so it acts on, say, one, two, three, in the way that you expect S3 to act on those three things. Um, and so in this setting, uh, we can consider Ks in some family uh, based, on their, um, based on their Gawa closure group. And so um, uh, Peter mentioned the work of Cohen and Lindstra from the 80s that gave conjectures on distributions of class groups of quadratic fields and also abelian number fields. And then that was extended um, in the 90s by a paper of Cohen Martinet to the quite general situation of any kind of Gawa closure group. And so putting those, those ideas together, these Papers of Cohen Lindstra and Cohen Lindstra Martinet give and conjecture on the distribution of the class group of K for K with a fixed. Galois closure group, um, and then plus, I'm not going to talk about this so much today, along with some behavior at infinity, which is the analog of like in the quadratic case we think of class groups of real quadratic fields and imaginary quadratic fields separately. And in particular, um, the conjecture, oops, um, which is a consequence of the conjectures of cohen lindstrom martinet So this is implied by the conjectures of cohen lindstrom martinet um, is that for L a prime, not dividing the order of some um, permutation group gamma, if we average over gamma fields, so we 
We're going to take some average over gamma field. So these are gamma extensions. So I'll define here this notation E gamma of x uh, to be the set of number fields with Gawa closure group gamma and discriminant up to x. So this is one of those cases uh, where, as Peter mentioned in his talk, the set that we're interested in is this countable set, and we have to um, uh, reach it in some way. So we do that by ordering the fields by discriminant and taking um, that discriminant to infinity. So this will average over that set. Um, Uh, the, so the conjecture is that the size of the L torsion, oops, this is L torsion, these are my square brackets here, um, over the size of that set is constant in size, so some constant that will depend on the features of the situation. And um, many times when you, if you've seen me talk about these conjectures, um, I'm very interested in the precise values of these constants, and I'll say something at the very end about precise values. But for most of the talk today, um, I'm interested. So this is some function of x, uh, and the conjectures, uh, we're interested in the, the, the size of this. The conjecture is that this is a size that should be constant on average, so yeah. Oh, um, oh, sorry. Little k was, was q. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. All right, yes. So I was, uh, this would be true even if, uh, if q, and q is kind of this q here over little k. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> forgot I had. So yes, yeah, so this whole story one, one I decided uh, for the talk to, to focus on the case over q, but one can do this over it. General number field, little k. Thank you for <laughs> um, noticing that. All right, so, um, so the conjecture is that these s implies, in particular, that these sizes uh, should be constant on average as the discriminant goes to infinity. Um, and so this is, the, this is the conjecture. And we'll, in general, what is known towards this conjecture is simply that this quantity is at most O of x to the 1 half plus epsilon. So growing at most in power about 1 half with x. All right, so this comes from the, the trivial bound. Um, but we think it should really be constant. Uh, and so, um, so this this is the kind of gap between what we know and um, and what we expect in terms of the average size of the growth of the L torsion in these families of number fields. Um, all right, so this can so this star. So that this um, average size of L torsion um, is constant uh, is known in very few cases. Um, so it's known previously in the case of S2, so those are quadratic extensions, and L equals 3 by Davenport and Heilbronn in 71. And then in this case of, I mentioned non Galois cubic, so S3 acting in its uh, usual permutation representation on three things for two torsion. Um, by Vargava uh, in 05. And so in this 
Um, yeah, so in this setting, these were the only um, gamma and L previously, where it was previously known that this L torsion was constant size on average, and our result Um, is that when gamma is a two group containing a transposition? Um, so, for example, D4 uh, in its usual way of being a subgroup of S4, i.e. a permutation group on uh, four elements. So that's the gamma, that's the Gaua closure group of a quartic D4 field. Um, and L equals three, so we're talking about the three torsion, then uh, it is true that the, the size of the three torsion in these fields is constant on average. So yeah. So for yeah. So for example, this um, this is a this tells you about that the average size of three torsion in D four quartic fields being constant, um, and then also this for many other two extensions. So um, uh, two extensions, right, is uh, referring to the fact that this Galois closure group is a two group. Um, and let me say something about this containing a transposition. Maybe I need a new board for that. So these, um, this is, This is a really relevant condition um, in this question of, of looking over families of number fields by um, discriminant. So um, there's a conjecture in general uh, of mala on the size of uh, this denominator here, the size of the number of gamma extensions, um, and one that we expect at least the sort of weak form of uh, to, to still be true, so it predicts asymptotics of this number of gamma extensions of discriminant up to x for all gamma, and the point, um, the, the key takeaway uh, with respect to this condition containing a transposition is if gamma contains a transposition, so for example, you know, SN acting on N things, so talking about degree and SN number fields, those Sn contains a transposition, so then Mala's conjecture um, implies that the number of gamma extensions up to discriminant x should be asymptotic to a constant times x. Um, otherwise, if not, if gamma doesn't contain a transposition, then Mala's conjecture um, implies uh, that the, this size is at most x to the 1 minus delta for some delta greater than 0. So of lower, of lower um, order magnitude. So there are some delicacies um, in Mala's conjecture about powers of log, um, 
Uh, so Kluner's found a counterexample to Mahler's original conjecture, and there are subtleties about, about that and what powers of log should be true. But at this level, um, I think people generally believe this. Uh, this has nothing to do with, with powers of log that might appear for these groups that appear more infrequently. Um, this just says, as we're looking, um, you know, as we're looking among number fields, which ones are the ones that appear sort of generically, uh, and those are the, the Gawa groups that contain a transposition, and which ones are the ones that appear more infrequently uh, compared to the sort of generic behavior, and those are the ones um, that uh, don't contain a transposition. So that's how to sort of interpret this condition on the group that it's, it's, it's something like the kind of generic ones of, uh, of the, the, the two groups. Um, so, um, and let me just say that, okay, this, this consequence of Mala's conjecture is known. So in general, um, Mala's conjecture is quite open, especially because it predicts these asymptotics, so in particular includes the inverse Galois problem. Um, but this, this consequence about the size uh, when it contains a transposition being constant x and otherwise being smaller is known, for example, when gamma is a two group by work of Kluner's Mala and Kluner's, and uh, for Sn, when n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, so classically, and by work of Davenport, Heilbronn, and um, Bargaba. So we do know, for example, among quartic fields, that the D4 quartics and the S4 quartics both appear um, a constant proportion of the time, and the other, um, other degree 4 fields appear less. Yes? We do need to know that um, because we, yeah, we compute the average by computing asymptotics of the numerator and the denominator. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's somehow our argument um, to get the numerator becomes a lot simpler if you replace all of those by one. So our argument uh, kind of necessarily produces a, a proof of the, the asymptotic of the denominator. So um, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is not a case. You could imagine a world where you could make some kind of argument about the average where you don't really understand the numerator and the denominator separately and there's like another another place and uh, some other question where something like that happens but here really you're understanding them separately yeah. okay. yes yes yeah, yeah, I, at the very end. So I will, and then if I, I, I run out of time, you'll have to ask me that question after the talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now let me, um, say something about, um, the ideas in the proof, what goes into the proof. Um, OK, so if f is a number field, um, we do a lot of uh, studying this Shintani zeta function. which. cubic OF algebras. So this is a sum over Q 
cubic OF algebras um, of non-zero discriminant. Um, and here we've got an automorphism factor, which don't worry, it's really in the denominator. Um, so I'll put it to minus one. Um, over um, a power that, and this is how this is a function of s. So this is like the Dirichlet generating series counting inversely weighted by their number of automorphisms, um, cubic algebras. So I'm taking, going to take the norm of the discriminant of r over o f to the s. Okay, so that's maybe hard to read. This is a sum over these cubic algebras, okay? So it's just a Dirichlet generating series for these cubic OF algebras um, by discriminant weighted by inversely proportional to the number of automorphisms there. Um, okay, wait, so what is this? So this is about counting, um, this is about counting cubic uh, algebras, and so how is this related? Um, so, it, uh, you haven't seen before, this, this relation goes back to how Davenport and Heilbronn understood um, the average of three torsion um, in, in quadratic fields. So if I had um, a, a quadratic extension, um, and then I have three torsion in a quadratic extension, I, by class field theory, get an unramified um, cyclic extension of order three. So this comes from three torsion or, you know, dually, uh, the size of the um, class group mod three times the class group. So if you have three torsion, you have something here that gives you unramified um, uh, a degree three extension, and this then turns out, so then um, also turns out by class field theory that this is a Galois S3 extension, and so inside of a Galois S3 extension, so it contains an actual cubic extension um, you know, somewhere in here, of which M is the Galois closure. And so this relationship um, uh, between three torsion in, uh, in class groups of quadratic extensions and, uh, and cubic extensions is, uh, is why studying the zeta function of cubic algebras can help tell us something um, about three torsion, and so, so these, this, um, zeta function was introduced by Shintani in 72, and then studied extensively by Datskowski and Wright in 86. And the result, um, especially of the work of Deskovsky and Wright, is that they understood the analytic behavior of um, this zeta function, um, in particular uh, its poles at s equals 1 and s equals 5, 6. Um, and analytic continuation, continuation, and a functional equation um, with a dual Dirichlet series. Uh, and this um, understanding of the analytic behavior of this Dirichlet series in particular uh, allowed um, Daskowski and Wright to prove an analog of this Davenport Heilbronn result, but with Q replaced by a general base field. So, um, so then 
Doskowski and Wright could then understand the average of the size of the three torsion um, in families of quadratic extensions of f for some f, f fixed. Um, and this um, is relevant to us um, because so our extensions of interest, um, which are extensions whose Galois closure group is a two group, um, these contain a subfield over which they are quadratic. So let me draw, try to draw, you know, some diagram. Um, so this is a gamma extension, and you have to be careful because this is—it's not the Galois gamma extension. It's the, um, uh, it's right, it's it's non-Galois. The Galois closure group contains a transposition, um, and then inside of there is a degree two extension um, uh, over, you know, just some degree two extension uh, because gamma contains a, a transposition. So over which k is quadratic. So th the overall plan Yeah, uh, all right. Yes, good point. Good point. Um it uh it will have good behavior for for us. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Fair. Good point. Good point. Um uh yeah, so um yeah, there's a, let me just a particular uh a um particular extension over which k uh, is quadratic that will have, have, have good behavior um, uh, for us because, because gamma contains a transposition. And our overall plan um, is, is to sum over these intermediate extensions um, and then use and sort of use the above understanding the understanding one gets from the Shintani zeta function from um, oh Deskovsky and Wright's work um, uh, to understand how in families um, uh, like this one um, one gets you know, one, you know, for a fixed F, I look at, at quadratic extensions, um, I understand the average size of three torsion. And so there are many issues that come up in this plan. I mean, among other things, one has to worry, well, if I, when if I fix some F and I take some quadratic extension, you know, how often is it actually a gamma extension or not? Um, but the main um, issue that is the main kind of difficulty is that if there were only finitely many f one needed to sum over, and one was just had to sum, say, the work of Daskovsky and Wright over finitely many f, there would really be no problem. Um, the problem is that one needs to understand this over infinitely many f, and in particular, f whose discriminant might be quite large compared to x, the bound that we're going up to. And so the work of Deskovsky and Wright really lets you understand this average in a long interval of discriminant, as the discriminant x is going to infinity. And what we require is some kind of control over this average in short intervals, intervals that are relatively short the range of discriminant that you are considering compared to the, the discriminant of uh, the field that you're taking quadratic extensions of. So uh, let me put this up. Okay. Okay. All right. So just to summarize what I said in words, so um, that this work of that Skowski 
right um, applies. Well, um, the approach, you know, okay, maybe I'll say, so this, this approach applies well um, when x is very big given some fixed f, and we're, we're summing up to discriminant of x, um, but we need to, need to understand um, Um, sum in so short, short intervals. I should say, to, to do this, um, uh, I'll just mention this in case it's the kind of thing that might be useful uh, to know that it's done. Even to do this case one, um, you know, we had to sort of redo the analysis of the Shintani zeta function uh, as done by Deskovsky and Wright, but paying attention everywhere to how um, the, the discriminant of the base field, or just the base field in general, plays into everything, and not just treating it as a constant, but getting some explicit dependence on the base field in understanding this analytic behavior of the Shintani zeta function. Um, okay, so maybe I should say in shorter intervals, um, because we have a couple of different arguments depending on the, the length of um, the, the interval <laughs> that one, um, one cares about. Um, so, okay. So, um, and I'll just mention the kinds of things that go into that. So, okay, so in... Um, the, the range where the discriminant of, of k, so that's our gamma extension, is about the cube of the, um, uh, the discriminant of f. So I'll say it's say between the discriminant of f uh, to the 2.9 and <laughs> the discriminant of f to the 3.1. Okay, so when the discriminant of k is about the cube of the discriminant um, of f, so, um, okay, so we need, it turns out that in this range, because of how many of these fields there are that contribute uh, to, to the sum, um, we need actually any savings of the trivial bound uh, for the relative class group of k over f's three torsion. Um, so, okay, I'm not going to write the size here, so I can, but I mean, we need the trivial bound for the size of this um, relative three torsion. I'm not going to write the size so I can tell you what I mean by the relative three torsion. So that's, for example, you could say the kernel of the norm map from the three torsion in the class group of K to the three torsion in the class group of this intermediate extension F. Okay, so I didn't say what the um, trivial bound for this relative um, uh, three torsion group is, and I don't actually mean the like trivial, trivial bound, where you say, well, this had to be in the class group of K, and so, um, uh, and so we use this, this bound. In fact, one can get a better, um, uh, one can get a better trivial bound um, uh, uh, for just this, this relative piece. Um, but in an analogous, in an analogous way. Um, okay, oh, now I have to do this, this hard work here. Okay. <laughs> what, oh, there's another? Okay, oh, maybe, okay, I can save, save, let's see. So what do we need to see? We, that one can go all the way up. I can write on this one, excellent, thank you. 
All right, so I'll get to say this. All right, so um, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, Alan Bergen. Vankatesh in 2007 showed um, how to use um, the Arakelov class group um, and small split primes, if you can find them. to get a savings over the trivial bound um, for L torsion um, in the class group. And so this, in general, um, if you're willing to assume GRH to know that you have, an, you know, the kind, kind of number of small split primes that you expect. Um, uh, so then conditional on GRH, it follows from um, the work of ellenberg Venkatesh that one gets some uh, savings. You know, you, you're not getting this, not getting epsilon, but you get to slice a little piece off of that um, one half. Um, so, we uh, generalize uh, this uh, work to a relative setting. So we generalize this strategy to something that works in the relative RKL of class group. Um, and so here, for example, this will let you see what the trivial bound is. So if k over f has um, in split completely primes of norm at most the discriminant of k to the delta for some small delta. This only works up to uh, a certain delta depending on L and the degrees of the fields involved. Okay, then we're going to get some get some savings in the size of the L torsion. So um, I'll write the trivial bound. So here, um, the trivial bound for the size of the relative L torsion coming from an analogous thing for the relative class group is the relative to the discriminant, the relative discriminant to the one half times the discriminant of the base field to the k over f minus one over two plus epsilon. Okay, so you can see here that this is not quite um, just like taking the discriminant of k over q uh, to the one half, and um, it turns out that this this difference uh, uh, it really matters um, in in the asymptotic counting of these things. So that's anyway that's what the trivial bound is, and this result says if you can find split primes, uh, you can save um, by by the however many split primes you find. Um, Oh, um, yes, uh, this is, so we, let's see, um, well, let's see, uh, the numbers, okay, I only will promise that these numbers are written correctly for the k over f in our situation quadratic, but we do prove uh, the, this for general extension k over f, that small split primes give you a savings. All right, especially here at the board, I won't promise, but it, you know these numbers uh, were right for a, a general case. Probably they are, because I've written K over F anywhere. But you can see in the paper that we write down um, 
the trivial bound and the savings you get over the trivial bound from small split primes um, it, for a general extension k over f. And then we use, but then you have to find those small split primes, um, which is hard in any particular field, but there have been, there's been um, a kind of surge in work in finding these small split primes um, in average, on average, uh, including work of, of Allenberg and Pierce and myself, uh, and then a whole line of work we use, some of the most recent uh, results of Limke, Oliver, and Thorner to find, on average, small um, small split primes. Um, yes? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And then the, the, we need absolute values here. Yes, so norm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so that leaves the sort of most difficult. So th those are, um, you know, so far I've talked about the ranges in which um, uh, you can, you know, sort of try to do what you might hope to try to do, and it turns out to work out. So the hardest um, range uh, turns out to be th when the discriminative k is between, um, say, the 3.1 power and the 6th power. Um, uh, of the discriminant of f. Um, and so here, um, really none of the things that have already been done or generalizations of those um, seem to work. And we, after trying many, many, many things that failed, um, we came up with an argument um, that we call propagation of orders. So um, in all of this, among these cubic algebras, the ones that we're interested in counting are really the maximal um, algebras, because those are the things that, via class field theory, you're getting. Um, uh, so we, um, OK. So we want to count maximal orders say, of discriminant at most x. And so usually, the traditional way that one does this um, is that we, the traditional way to do this is to count all the orders of discriminant up to x. So usually, usually to do this, you count all the orders of discriminant most x, and then you sieve out to try to get the maximal ones. And that makes a lot of sense. But instead, so what we do, and usually you wouldn't, if you only want maximal orders of discriminant most x, you know, you don't want to count any more orders than discriminant most x. Um, but instead, so we count orders of, um, discriminant, say, at most, all the orders of discriminant most zx. So now, every maximal order contributes m many, many things to this count. It contributes itself. And then, so z is some parameter that we haven't yet fixed. Um, uh, and it counts all of its, its suborders as well. Um, and explicitly, so, um, so this overcounting in this range, it turns out that um, the uh, the frequency of orders produced by every maximal order lets you get better control of the number of maximal orders by counting all the orders in a bigger range and dividing out by the number of orders inside there than if you just counted maximal orders. So you know we take. Um, take z to be about the discriminant of f, 
which in the fixed F regime is just some constant. So that doesn't sound like very much. But remember, the whole thing that we're trying to do here is to understand things in short intervals. Um, and so uh, the discriminant of F1 is not thinking of as constant, but is growing. Um, all right, so that, that is the sort of new strategy that lets us deal with the hardest um, range. And so now um, I will just end um, in somewhere that I don't have to erase the board <laughs> um, by uh, answering, saying something um, in to response to Alina's question. So in general, we give this constant explicitly um, as an infinite sum, an infinite sum whose convergence is quite fast, so you can compute it um, explicitly. And that, but that constant uh, is not, is not the same as the constant that is predicted by cohen lindstrom martinet heuristics for a reason that we understand and um, uh, is nicely explained in a paper of Alex Bartel and Hendrik Lenstra that in this sum for every fixed intermediate field F, um, that, this, that part of the sum concerning that F contributes a positive proportion to the count. Um, but if you get around that, so, and simply look at the relative three torsion here uh, between K and F, so sort of over these K, uh, so gamma containing a transposition as above, the relative three torsion Um, the average of the relative three torsion is as predicted by Cohen, Lenstra, Martin. All right, thank you.